They can see. Perfect. All right. So let's begin. And I think we have like 55 minutes uh, for these uh, talks until Bill or Mel comes and kicks me out. All right. So let's start. And uh, like I said, thank you uh, for being here um, with me and uh, all of the other speakers that you see around today. Um, uh, thanks for uh, kind of tuning in to Philly.net. I, I presume this is the first virtual one. I think I've been to three or four uh, in-person filler.nets over the years. Um, so um, I'm glad at least we are able to hang out uh, together. So uh, this will be an hour on SignalR, uh, all types of real-time uh, applications and then communications between different platforms. Uh, so it should be fun. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, hopefully uh, keep you awake if you need to go and grab a cup of coffee, please do so. But I'll, I'll have plenty of like failing demos to uh, keep us company. Uh, so my name is Sam Basu. I am uh, a developer advocate at uh, Progress Software. Uh, you might know us from uh, the things we build. Um, that's a lot of Telerik, uh, Kenda UI, Fiddler, and everything we can really to make developers more productive. Uh, that right there is also my social handle, uh, really anywhere. Um, so Twitter, GitHub, uh, Skype, anywhere you need to get hold of me. I'm I'm always chatty. Uh, so let's let's talk about anything you have questions about, concerns about, anything you like or not like. Uh, so yeah, let's spend some time uh, diving into real time apps. Uh, before we start, though, um, uh, I, I do want to make the disclaimer like this, uh, starting from. 2020. Uh, these are uh, weird and, and really difficult times for a lot of people. Uh, so I hope that um, you're you're staying safe and, and your family is healthy and we are doing all we can to be productive. I think as an industry, like we at least have the option of um, continuing business as normal, but a lot of industries don't. So let's uh, uh, let's be thankful and uh, do the best we can. Uh, like they say, like uh, 2021 maybe started off on not the best of uh, things, but again, all signs point towards uh, us getting back to some form of normalcy later on in this year. So please take care of yourself uh, and your families. Now, I uh, I think most of you are from the Philly area. Um, since we are remote, I, I like bringing out a map. Uh, so I'm also in Pennsylvania, but the absolute other corner, there is, uh, we call it the chimney, there's a tiny slice of Pennsylvania that kind of juts out in between Ohio and, uh, and New York, I'm right up uh, by the lake. Uh, did anyone have a question or, oh no, just Mel just uh, maybe came on. Um, yeah, I, I will keep uh, checking the chat room uh, on and off, uh, so please type in anything. And it's Saturday, you may hear my kid uh, shouting a little bit in the background. And I do apologize for the green screen. I'm a streamer, um, so I'm, I'm just too lazy to bring it down uh, on, on weekends. Uh, but yeah, I'm in uh, Erie, Pennsylvania, right up by the lake. Uh, it, I like joking that it takes me seven and a half to like eight hours to get to Philly or I can get on a boat and I'm in Canada in like 30 minutes or so. <laughs> so yeah, I'm on the other side of uh, Pennsylvania. It's a big state that we have. Okay, so um, hopefully maybe some of you have um, heard about real-time apps or maybe dabbled or built some things with SignalR. If so, I, I would love to know what you're building, what your experience has been like. Uh, but again, I, I understand some of you um, may not have, right? So uh, let's uh, spend just a little bit of time uh, up front, kind of setting the stage, and then we'll dive into SignalR, we'll dive into some demos, uh, look at some fun stuff, but let's understand what's going on. What exactly is the problem? What's, what are we trying to solve? So first up, pop quiz uh, for you on a Saturday morning. You didn't realize you were going to be subject to a quiz. Who is this gentleman? Anyone know? I'll give you 20 seconds. Anyone know who this is? No? You guys can unmute if you want to. Yeah, you, you can all like turn on your cameras, turn on your microphones. <laughs> Robin Williams. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that's stumped. classic answer. That, that's, I'm stumped, yeah. <laughs> All right, folks, and, and this may be a tricky folks uh, question if you are not into uh, history. So this gentleman is called Sir Tim Berners-Lee. 
A lot of folks mistakenly kind of call him the father of the internet, which again, you can call him that, but the, the fundamentals of the internet, like we know it, like those were in place, like from the 1960s, maybe even like, if you remember like DARPAnet on those days, uh, so TCP IP, those things were in place. But what uh, Tim Berners-Lee did was he was working at CERN, which is a particle physics uh, laboratory in, in Switzerland. And he came up with the first standards for what we know as HTTP, right? So hypertext transfer protocol. So he really is the, is the father of HTTP. Um, and uh, the web has come so far in, in 30 years and, and we still use it, right? Uh, sure, we have HTTP2, uh, but the, the, the fundamentals haven't really changed all that much. It is still very much a request and response based protocol. Um, so you have various types of clients and you have a server who's hosting something and you make a request and you get a response back. Nothing wrong in that. That's how the web operates, except we run into some fundamental challenges since we are trying to get around uh, this uh, thing with HTTP. So uh, why do we need real-time apps in the first place? Um, well, we are on a team's call and you, you can see things in real time. So almost everybody starts with a chat application because that's kind of the first example and, and we'll start there as well. Uh, but I mean, you can look around and just see how many apps today that you need, um, uh, that you use, uh, that need real-time communications today, and we can just go on and on, right? So clearly there is a need, um, but this is not the easiest thing to do. And again, this is not a new problem. We have been dealing with this for a long, long time now. The problem is, again, we are up against HTTP, uh, and, and, and no matter what you're doing at .NET, JavaScript, PHP, whatever, this is hard because again, you are you're up against some fundamental challenges of how the web operates, right? So you're, you're trying to keep your bandwidth uh, uh, and network uh, things in mind. And again, we as developers, we love uh, building apps. Uh, I, I come from a lot of uh, .NET background. I have done just enough JavaScript to be dangerous. So you can see a little bit of both, um, but um, it, this is hard, right? No matter what it is. So what we're looking for is ideally not that request and response thing. Uh, we are looking for like a full duplex, like bi-directional connection between the client and the server at all times, and, and that's hard. So like I said, this is not a new problem. So uh, I'm going to try to explain some of the crux of how SignalR works, uh, and then we'll get to all of this. These are some basic things before we get to SignalR, and I'm going to try to give you maybe uh, some funny examples as we go along. So okay, like I said, this is nothing new, and we have been figuring out solutions for to this for a while now. So this was one of the first things we did, regular polling, right? So Envision, we have a server and a client of any type, right? So if uh, any of you have little kids at home, uh, I have a five-year-old, and when you when you start your drive, when maybe you're going somewhere, like a minute out of the garage, they start asking like, are we there yet? Are we there yet, right? And it keeps on going until you're there. Uh, so that's periodic polling. So this periodic like time interval could be uh, whatever you want based on what your app uh, is. And you just keep on asking the server, do you have anything new? And uh, the server for the most time says no. And then eventually you have something new and then you have yes. Now, this is not as bad as it sounds, right? Uh, uh, this polling interval really could be like five seconds, right? And then you are, uh, you're pretty close to real time. Um, you are making a whole bunch of unnecessary trips because you get in, you don't know if the server has anything new, um, but it's not a whole lot of like wasted bandwidth on, on mobile because like half the time the server says no, and you're not carrying any data back and forth. So this is there, um, but clearly we can do better, right? So then we started, uh, we learned and we started doing what's called long polling. Same same idea, you got a server, you got a client, and this is where uh, when your kid asks you, like, are we there yet? You as a parent just don't respond, right? You just stay silent until you get to the destination or like there's a full on meltdown going on in, in the back seat, right? So here, same idea, the client says, do you have anything new? The server simply sits on that request until something new happens or um, the client uh, has uh, has like a timeout thing, and then so it's a, the, that request is about to be terminated, or maybe the server has too many connections and you're managing too many threads, and you have to terminate that, and you can respond. So this is obviously a step in the right direction because now the server at all times has a request, hopefully that it can serve if something happens. But it needs a little bit of work on both sides uh, to make it. Um, kind of nice and smooth. Uh, so, but this is definitely um, a, a big um, kind of step in the right direction. 
And then we did a whole bunch of things in the middle. Uh, these were uh, kind of the early 2000s and uh, uh, the, the social media things were coming along, YouTube was coming along. Uh, this is like server sent events and an example is where you say uh, maybe you go to a store or you go to your website and you uh, just uh, say fine I'll subscribe to your emails and then you get emails every hour, right? Or maybe that's an exaggeration every every day. So this is kind of one way push, right? So if you have uh, like Twitter or Facebook type things where you're not really asking the server, the server just has new stuff. And as long as you have a connection, it just keeps on sending things over the wire to you. Uh, so again, this needs a little bit of orchestration. Uh, there is essentially like a uh, I forget the event name. It's called event uh, event something. So you essentially listen to that event, and then um, you might have a timeout. You might need to reconnect, but uh, it, it works, right? And then uh, I think this was back uh, 2012 ish time frame where we started talking about web sockets like seriously. I mean, there have been other platforms that did it. It it became serious when HTML5 picked it up and said, yeah, let's do it. And in the early days. Um, support was a little spotty. Uh, thankfully, things have come a long way. I mean, the browser wars are behind us, but uh, there are still some differences here and there. But for the most part, most of the evergreen browsers do this uh, fairly well. And uh, uh, my, my example here, which which may not be a very politically correct example, but I mean, yeah, we're we're on Teams, right? We're not on the internet, so I can say it. Um, uh, I come from uh, an Indian background, right? But um, I'm brown, so when I, um, I I travel a lot, so when I go down to like parts of like Florida or, or California, Southern California or Mexico, uh, folks would come up to me and say, hola. And if I say hola back, uh, that's a handshake that I speak your language. Then the Spanish flies at me and I don't understand a word of it. <laughs> so that that's just an exchange, just a handshake to say, can the server and the client speak the same language? If so, we can step down from HTTP and we can have back and forth communications. And this, again, when it works, this thing is beautiful uh, until like somebody says disconnect and you walk away. Um, so this is really full duplex multi-directional communication. Server can call the client anytime and vice versa. So uh, nothing like it when this works. Um, what time is it? Um, Robin, uh, not the author of SignalR. Uh, that's funny. OK, I will keep checking the chat room once in a while, but uh, yeah, hopefully all of you are here. Let me check. Um, oh, nice. Uh, quite a few of you in the chat room. Yeah, thank you for joining. And uh, yeah, it looks like a lot of you joined right as we were starting. So uh, we talked about WebSockets, and, and this clearly works. Um, and, and when it works, it's beautiful. So again, uh, we talked about some of these things. Uh, there, there are a few more around. Uh, I'm old enough, I, I did a little bit of Flash, I did a little bit of Silverlight back in my days, and we had uh, plugins uh, that did uh, sockets, and yeah, uh, plugins are done. Um, if you are an IE, and hopefully you're not having to support IE still, uh, but IE did a, a particularly weird trick called Forever Frames, where you put like a hidden iframe <laughs> on your page, and you had a little bit of JavaScript that calls back to the server and tries to get stuff. Uh, not, not the cleanest thing. Uh, now, the other thing that you might be hearing quite a bit is gRPC. Essentially, RPC is remote procedure calls, right? And um, uh, this is an open source standard now. It's lightweight. It's, it's based on protobuf, which will We'll look at them like message protocol in a bit, uh, and it's 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 lightweight. It's good for microservices, and it's it's something actually ASP.NET team supports. So uh, that's an option if you wanted to go uh, do that instead of SignalR. Um, but again, as as developers, like all of these are different strategies and technologies, right? And you are having to deal with so much before you can actually write up your app. So wouldn't it be nice if? Somebody did that, did that for you, right? And that's exactly where um, uh, SignalR comes in. So uh, yeah, like I talked about in gRPC, take a look at this. Uh, this is actually fully supported inside of uh, C Sharp and Go and Python, whatever it is that you're doing. Um, now let's talk about SignalR and where it sits. And before we do that, like let's talk about .NET just real quick because that's where we are going to stand on today. Uh, so, I mean, some of these are Microsoft slides that you may have seen before. Uh, .NET has evolved a lot, so it's not just for the web or desktop. It serves any number of platforms, and the tools of our trade have come a long way. Uh, I love saying, like, this is the .NET of yesterday, because this was, like, uh, the .NET 
.NET until like uh, November of last year when they had .NET Conf. Uh, so we had a few different .NETs. We had the framework, we had .NET Core, we had Mono for Xamarin, uh, and then uh, as we stand today, it's it's one unified .NET. Uh, there is still quite a bit of work left to be done uh, with .NET 5, uh, but I mean, it's out there. They're, they're trying to take the best of .NET Core. They're trying to take the best of Mono, put it all together into a runtime that Blazor can uh, work off, that Xamarin can work off. So uh, all things in the right direction. So actually, let me go back. So the signal art that uh, we're going to talk about, it actually first started uh, right up here in the purple uh, box with Dotman Framework. This was already in like 2011, 2012 is when this started. And then they supported it for like three, four years. And then uh, .NET Core came along, which is lean, modular, cross-platform, wonderful. And um, they had other priorities, essentially. So when .NET, ASP.NET Core launched, they did not have SignalR in it for the first like two years or so. And then it came back, I think, in 2016. So um, that's where we are playing. We are playing with all things um, uh, ASP.NET. Now, an obvious question is, are you stuck to ASP.NET or .NET land if you're doing SignalR? And the answer is no. Your your backend, your your hosting, that is the piece that needs to be on ASP.NET or wherever you're hosting it. But the clients can be anything, which I'll I'll try to show you. I'll try to show you some mobile and and some desktop demos as well, if I if I can. Now these two gentlemen, the only reason I bring them up is they are extremely smart uh, engineers. Uh, one on the left is David Fowler. One on the right is Damien Edwards. Uh, they both are senior engineers on the ASP.NET team, and I believe like uh, you you can look up some stories, but they were having a really hard time with like document collaboration uh, back in the days. Uh, so they were the first ones to push their teams to build SignalR back in like 2012, uh, and and to this day, like if you're using uh, like any anything like Office related, uh, like online and collaboration for any Office um, uh, products, I think they are using SignalR behind the scenes. So I mean, it's absolutely well tested and. and scalable. So what is it? Um, so far, we have just done intros, but here we are getting into it. It is for ASP.NET and it's for ASP.NET Core. It is just uh, a shim that sits on top of ASP.NET that relieves you, the developer, from having to worry about the network and the transport. So it's given a server, given a client, it'll figure out what's the best network. Because we talked about so many things like regular polling, long polling, server sent, or can I do web sockets, right? And if it cannot, then it has like fallback plans. Um, and it has a wonderful set of APIs that we can use to manage things on the server and manage things on the client side and uh, scales nicely and everything is good, right? It, this is this is a lot of fun. It's I think it's one of the best um, and, and the coolest piece of technologies in ASP.NET land, maybe after Blazor now. Um, but again, everything is open source, so everything we are looking at SignalR is open source. Um, so um, let me see, chat room, anything you're saying? Uh, maybe yes. Is SignalR part of .NET 5? Uh, Bill is asking, yes, yes, sir, it is. Uh, it absolutely is. It's part of uh, ASP.NET Core, which is sitting on SignalR. Uh, Microsoft does not like us calling it SignalR Core because that's kind of how a lot of us started calling it because it it came like after a break. So you had SignalR support for ASP.NET and now you have SignalR support for ASP.NET Core. So yes, either way, you, you can absolutely run it on .NET 5. Um, the reason I bring up this picture is actually this is a newer airport uh, in in Beijing. I think it's called Daxing Airport, and it's just the shape of it is is classic like hub and spoke model. And if you are into aviation, uh, you you know that a um, uh, lot of airlines and a lot of different industries they work in a hub and spoke model. Like the smaller regional jets, they try bringing you to a hub from where you can go everywhere. And that's exactly what uh, SignalR does as well under the covers. So a hub essentially, just think of it like an object uh, in memory that's uh, been held on the server side that keeps track of all the clients that are connected. And you can group the clients, you can send information to each client, you can identify each client, you can send stuff to individual clients or all of them together. It's just a way, nice way to have an API set that you can work with any context, any client, and just kind of manage them nicely, right? So uh, again, if you have done any ASP.NET Core, this is essentially middleware. Uh, so if you think about, about the whole like ASP.NET pipeline and how the requests flow in and out, this is sitting right on top uh, before it gets to the ASP.NET processing. So you have access to all of the things that you uh, kind of expect. You have authentication, authorization, logging. You can do all of that because you have the full request 
and the full re response going out, right? So you can do all of that, but it's kind of a subset. And when you set up hubs, you're essentially telling ASP.NET to say, don't do your regular like page processing because that's not what it is. This is kind of a lower level processing. So let the hub do the processing and, and the uh, work that it needs to do the responses um, between the server and the client. OK, so um, uh, I'm, I'm talking more and more, but uh, I'll, I'll jump into some demos so that make it hopefully a little more clearer. Um, again, like the hub gives you the choice in, in the different transfer protocols. And thankfully, this is not something you have to worry about as a developer. Uh, it'll start out using or trying to use WebSockets. If not, it falls back to uh, service end event, falls back to regular polling uh, or no, like long polling. And like really, if nothing else works, it'll, it's going to uh, come down to regular polling, but it, it tries the best possible thing. Uh, something that it does really nicely out of the box is serialization, deserialization, because you are sending stuff across the wire, right? So you need it uh, as uh, flattened as possible. So the built-in thing is with JSON, even soft or .NET JSON, uh, but that's human readable. If you want it to be a little more flatter uh, and conscious of bandwidth, then you want, want to use message pack, which is binary. So you, you are sending things as uh, small as possible. So it's just a little more performant and then compact compared to JSON. Now, here's my one minute spiel on, um, on, on the UI side of it. Uh, like I said, I work for Progress Software and, and we make Telerik for all things .NET. And um, this is for web, desktop, and mobile. And we also make things for all of the JavaScript audiences, which is, again, Kendigo is a very popular library. And uh, it's a testament to how the web has evolved over the last like 10 years. We started out purely as a jQuery library, but now we make components for Angular, Vue, and, and React. And yes, all of our stuff will work with uh, SignalR if you are hosting it, if you have the right um, infrastructure to host it. OK, so uh, that's all uh, I had to kind of talk through. Let's uh, look at some stuff, shall we? So let's see, chat room, anything? Uh, Colin is asking, is Signal supported by other systems and languages? Um, uh, Colin, can you explain like what do you, what do you mean by other systems? Like, do you mean like other clients? Then yes, absolutely. Um, uh, languages, um, like you, you, you're, uh, your web part of it, that has to be uh, Linux and Python. Okay. Um, so, again, so you're, you're hosting uh, the thing that's powering your web application. Essentially, it's a web application that you're building, and then the client can be anything. Uh, so, that has to be an ASP.NET. And you, you can host ASP.NET applications on a Linux box, um, but uh, that has to be ASP.NET or .NET or C Sharp. But then the, the, uh, the clients can really be anything else. Uh, I, I think you can do stuff with Python because again, I mean, uh, at, at the core of it, like if you can do JavaScript, then you can do everything on the web stack. So let me let me show you this. Uh, actually, if you wanted to start, uh, look up SignalR, and uh, these are the docs for it. Uh, these are the transports that it supports, and these are the hubs. When you look at like supported platforms, then uh, you get all of the modern browsers. So. This is where you kind of get into the clients. So what can connect up to a SignalR hub? So you have .NET, obviously. And this .NET client is actually real nice because it works for all things .NET, um, be it web, desktop, or console, or whatever. Um, you can do Xamarin, obviously, with, to target iOS or Android. You can do um, a, a JavaScript client, which is for all things web. So again, if you have Python or if you have PHP, if you can sneak in a little bit of JavaScript, then that, that's all you need to power that. Uh, you have Java and you have kind of an unsupported C++ or Swift if you're doing like native Objective-C. So that's where we stand. I think like the community has written over the years like a few more client wrappers for a few other platforms, but like these are the ones that Microsoft feels comfortable uh, talking about, okay? Um, so let's uh, let's take a look um, and uh, see if we can get some of this stuff to work and see it in action. So I will pull up VS for Mac because I'm on a Mac. Uh, let's start with this one. Anybody else use Visual Studio on a Mac? Just me. It's uh, it's about the same, like especially if you're doing like ASP.NET or Xamarin or Azure development. It's it's about the same. Uh, probably crashes a little less than the Windows version, but it's just Visual Studio. And I use VS Code. Like for everything that we are doing with SignalR, you can use VS Code as well. All right. So let's take a look. Um, this one here. Let's uh, let's start with this simple one. So. 
Um, this is a project where if you do file new project uh, ASP.NET, you are just starting out with a template and that's what I have. Uh, so there are two aspects of this. There is a server side aspect, which is actually built inside of .NET. Uh, so you, there's nothing else you need to do. But the client side, uh, particularly if you're using a JavaScript client or a .NET client, you have to get those bits ready. So uh, this one here, um, you'll notice that, uh, let me make things a little bigger if I can. So this one here is a simple chat application. Again, if you're looking for the code for this, this is just like straight out of the docs, nothing spectacular, but I'll show you some um, funny things you can do to kind of have, uh, kind of play around with this a little bit. So this is just a standard ASP.NET project, right? Nothing uh, spectacular about it. It's ASP.NET, I think, uh, three. Uh, and so it, it, this is not like an MVC project. It has pages, www.prod, but pretty much standard um, ASP.NET. And if you look at the dependencies here, um, we are depending on uh, .NET and .NET Core. Right, and, and this one does not have the client side bits yet, but we can bring them down because those are just JavaScript. So everything in a SignalR um, thing kind of starts out with the hub. So we are essentially, we have the namespace, we can now create a hub. Uh, and within that hub, we can define functions and methods. This one here, it's everything is over async. Uh, so it's um, await and async, it's nice. And this one here is a method that says, uh, whatever number of clients are connected to it, we can refer to all of them and we can send along a message that we get from any client. So client one connects up to the server hub and sends me these two, I can send it right back to every other client that is connected, right? And at startup, all we have to do is uh, Enable SignalR. Again, remember this is kind of middleware, so it's kind of working right on top of ASP.NET. And we have to enable the uh, hub. So we can talk to whenever we say WAC chat hub, we are talking to that particular chat hub. Uh, so we know which hub it is. And on the client side, like this is where we are hosting the server and the client side on the same project, right? So the client side is a couple of JavaScript files. And you can do whatever it is that you want to pull down JavaScript files from. You can uh, put them in your project if you want. Uh, this one's using libman uh, and it's pulling it down with a provider called unpackage, which is kind of a CDN. So you deliver this closer to where your users are. Essentially, you're getting a couple of SignalR JavaScript files and, and that's it. So um, this is kind of the hello world demo that everybody starts with. So let's start there and then we'll um, have a little fun. So let me go ahead and run this. And in the meantime, let me know if any of the code is not visible or if I can make things any bigger. Chat room, you look quiet for now, so I will keep on going. Sorry, I got like bright sunshine coming in from a window, so hopefully that's not bothering any of you. Um, okay, so this is kind of uh, a typical uh, chat application, right? Um, we can make this one a little smaller. All right, and we can perhaps pull up uh, something else. Uh, let's do Edge, uh, which is also Chromium now. Uh, so here we can also go localhost, if I can type 5001. So same app, uh, everything is running localhost. Uh, you, you know where I'm going with this. So user one can say hi, and there you go. It shows up right here. And user two can say hello and shows up right there. So it's instantaneous, right? So that's what we want. Now, if you take a look at uh, what's happening under the covers a little bit, uh, so let me see if I have my shortcuts right. Uh, no, I clearly don't. Why am I getting mail? <laughs> I don't want to email anybody. Uh, okay, go away, go away mail. All right, uh, I was trying to get dev tools up, which clearly did not work. Uh, Command shift I, I thought that's what I did. All right. Okay, um, so if I look at DevTools and if I look at network, uh, you'll see there's a WebSockets thing. So if I reload this, uh, you see that little WebSockets thing going across. Um, so notice how the protocol is, is JSON, right? So if I say user3 said, hola, sticking to our kind of Spanish example. So you can see like right here, U3 Ola, right? So it, it literally is JSON over the wire, right? And you can read that, uh, which is kind of fun to see exactly what your app is doing. And it's just real time over the uh, over the wire. So what's happening here while we run this is a uh, couple of things. So this is our client side, right? And remember, it has the JavaScript to function. Uh, so it has two of the input controls. And when you hit the send button, it comes down to this little bit piece of JavaScript. And the JavaScript says, okay, I know that when you hit the send button, 
uh, here's what I'm going to do. When you, uh, we're going to get the send button from the DOM. We're going to capture what the user typed in, user and message. And then we're going to use that connection. This connection, by the way, is this. The connection is straight up connecting to that SignalR hub with the name chat hub. So we can we know exactly who we are talking to. And then we can invoke this method called send message on the server. And we're going to pass in these two things. And the server is actually this. So we are invoking this method from the client side, and we are sending in two things. And the client uh, and the server now says, OK, and let me just broadcast this back out to everybody who's listening. In this case, the client who made the call in the first place is also going to be called back, right? And the server is going to call back something called received message on each client. And that also needs to be on your client side. So we have a received message method right here which essentially gets back for this client. It doesn't really matter because it's getting back exactly what when you have multiple clients, then it's getting back what the other client said, and it's just appending that to that list, and we have a message list, okay? Pretty simple, uh, just kind of a hello world uh, example, right? Uh, so uh, while we have this, uh, let's uh, let's open up something else. Uh, let me, uh, what time is it? 32, so we got a little bit of time. New instance of Visual Studio. And uh, let's do uh, a different client. Because that's the JavaScript client, right? So again, any web stack that you're doing, if you can do JavaScript, you can do uh, what I just did. Chat room, any questions? No, you're yeah, good. OK. All right, so here, uh, things get a little diff different. Um, so let me um, let me turn this off, and we'll go back to uh, this. So again, uh, folks who have done any um, uh, mobile stuff will know right away what this is. This is Xamarin Forms, right? So here, uh, I'm targeting iOS or Android or Tizen or whatever else that, that comes to mind. So this is, again, file new project, uh, Xamarin. You get one project that is kind of your .NET standard library that you share between everything, and uh, there is no platform specific code anywhere here. Uh, if you look at uh, the dependencies here, here we are actually depending on uh, Xamarin Forms, Xamarin Essentials, but this one here has that signal on our client side. So now it's a NuGet package. It's not a website. It's the mobile app, so now we have a NuGet package that's embedded in it that knows how to talk back to our hub. So here, um, this is my uh, little uh, UI. It's just a XAML uh, layout here, Visual Studio, uh, Visual Layout. It has a couple of entry boxes and it has a button. Uh, and then on the uh, code behind, what we're doing is exactly the same thing that we did kind of on the website. We are creating a hub connection. And the hub connection talks to localhost. Uh, let me shrink this a little bit more. Or not? Yeah. So the hub connection is talking to my local host and 5001, which is where my IP is for my local website, and it's talking to Chat Hub. So it is actually literally doing the connection, uh, start async, and then when I hit the button, it's going to grab the username and uh, text and send it off. So uh, if I run this now. And uh, since this is Xamarin, it knows that it needs to go to Xcode, do the build, and come back uh, on the iOS simulator. I'll give it a second. There you go. Hopefully, you can see it uh, on my screen. Come on. And let's make this one a little smaller. You see, you know where I'm going with this. Um, but just, uh, it's nice to be able to kind of cross uh, boundaries here. Um, okay, so let's uh, go back here. So we're going to say web says hi, if it's still up. Yeah, right there. You see that? Now it's a native iOS app or a native Android app, and, and it still works. And iOS can say, oh my god, this works. Send. Yeah, see that? Instantaneous. This is nice, because now we have two clients. One is JavaScript, one is .NET. Uh, in, I mean, .NET uh, in the form of Xamarin, which is running inside of iOS. So now we are connecting both through the same hub, and the hub is just like uh, broadcasting to everybody, so we get to listen in, right? So this this is working. Uh, let's let's change this up to a slightly different uh, demo here, uh, just to kind of give you a feel. Um, so this um, uh, the text chat is just kind of hello world, which is fine, um, but you you don't get a whole lot. And uh, the thing to kind of uh, that should be concerning here is. 
it has this receive message uh, function again the client so the server can actually call in so think about what's happening here you have an asp.net server that is invoking a function that's sitting inside of your ios application so that's pretty cool but we are dealing with a lot of like magic strings and then that's not fun so uh, you don't have to do this signal not actually has um, a lot of like like hub of the type t so you can have strongly typed things um, but what if you are dealing with slightly bigger objects, uh, slightly more complex things? Uh, so here, let me switch back to the other page that I had. So I'm just literally switching the first page of my app. Uh, envision like you building like a dashboard where you have maybe folks uh, with mobile devices or tablets going out to a field. Uh, maybe you want to have uh, like real time notifications or gauges or charts kind of showing them what's going on in the field maybe or you have like service in the back uh, and you're trying to kind of get an idea of what the real state of the system is. So envision a dashboard, right? Uh, so if I go ahead and run this now, and I'll show you what the code looks like. Uh, let's see if this will work first. OK, there you go. So now you have a dashboard. Let's go back to our web client. OK, so we're going to go to dashboard here. So now you're seeing, and again, I'm biased, obviously, but um, this is a little bit of Telerik UI. You don't have to use it, but I wanted to show you a dashboard where you have a chart or a graph. So this one here is a gauge. Uh, it's a Xamarin gauge. This one here is a grid. So uh, this gauge needle here, um, I can change it to whatever I want. Now, again, envision like this uh, server probably is connected to maybe an IoT device or something that you are keeping track of, maybe temperature or whatever. When I do the gauge update here, um, you'll notice that the needle went up to 90, right? And, and we can do this all day long. Um, and just to kind of give you a feel, like uh, this is a way in which you can provide a real-time dashboard to your users on any platform. Uh, in this case, you're just carrying a piece of numbers that that's not important. Uh, but this one here is a grid. Uh, it's A and B and it's like one category and one value. And I, I don't have like text boxes here. I should probably should add that to uh, what I have here. Uh, but when I hit the grid update, uh, we are essentially going to repaint the grid a little bit uh, with the values changing. So what's this? When I hit grid update, this becomes five and 10, right? So how did that work? And what's going on under the covers? So let's take a look. First thing is if we go back to our uh, web side of things, this was my dashboard hub. So when we did the uh, gauge update, that is just sending a string. But when we did the chart update, which was connected to the grid, now we're talking a specific type of uh, object. It's called chart data, and uh, it's like a POCO object. And I'm, I'm old. <laughs> POCO is a plain old CLR object. It's a .NET object or a class, right? So think about a very complex class that you might have, like a user class or a customer class, and you want to flatten it all out send that whole object over the wire, that's all doable because it, it is just all JSON and it'll serialize and deserialize. So here we are sending that chart data across and uh, this is the little UI that you saw with the gauges and this is the JavaScript. So again, when I send the dash update, I'm literally grabbing what the value is on the gauge and sending that over. But when I send um, the object update, I am actually building this like chart data right here. This is pure JSON, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm hard coding five and 10 here. You don't have to obviously, but think about like a big JSON object. It's all flattened. You can send it over the wire. And uh, on the server side, uh, this one here is expecting an array of, of that object type. So it will deal with anything that you give it. Okay, makes sense so far. Uh, let me see chat room. Oh, Rajiv, you were on uh, yesterday for one of my sessions. Thank you. Thank you for joining in. Clearly, I did not uh, bore you to death yesterday, so here I am back. What is the best practice for troubleshooting? Also, what can we do when the messages are not <laughs> even getting into the hub? Okay, okay, yeah. So this is .NET, right? So you can debug. Every time you hit the client or you hit the server, you can debug and see um, what is it that the server is getting? And so, and then you will run into this invariably the moment you start coding. Like, you need to know what the client is calling into and how is the server responding. You should be able to see those requests. If you don't even see that request come in from the server, then you have to go down and see what uh, Signalar is doing in terms of network stack. And also, you can log things. Uh, again, uh, the docs have very good documentation on logging things. Uh, so you can see what the requests are from every client, where it's falling apart, um, and and so on. So hopefully, uh, Sam. Uh, yeah, Raji has his hand up. 
I don't see a hand up, but uh, participant. Oh, yeah. I mean, go, go ahead and turn on your microphone. Just, just ask. Uh, oh, uh, okay. Rock Ranjan is asking: Do we need to worry about multi-threading here? <laughs> Good question. Um, yes and no, right? Yes and no. Uh, the thing is, on the server side, when you have, um, uh, well, uh, somebody has their microphone on, so uh, if you don't mind muting just for a second, please. So um, on the server Sorry. side, yeah, uh, on the server side, no worries. Uh, on the server side, you are um, looking to allocate threads, right? So every request and response, everything that you open with the uh, with the connection, the hub, uh, we'll talk about this. Uh, I got like maybe 15 minutes left. Um, everything is in memory, right? So it will start taking a toll. Uh, if you have uh, a lot of connections. And here's what I can do. I can open up my local host and you folks can see it right away uh, where it gets overloaded very quickly because uh, local host is just uh, running on IIS Express. So yes, you um, you will have to worry about uh, just overloading your server, but by default, uh, SignalNR has some smartness to not just allocate one thread to one connection and be done with it because one connection might not be be very chatty, right? So you don't want to allocate the whole thing, but everything is coming to the server and everything is in memory by default. You can write it out if you want. Um, so um, yeah, it, 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 is a, it is a concern and it is something to keep in mind. But again, SignalNR has been proven to be very scalable uh, on some fronts. Uh, and let me get back a little bit more to that. Uh, please see one more question above. Okay. Um, Oh, I see. Uh, sorry, Rajiv, didn't see that. Can you please show us the client side again? Does the client need to be part of the same project? Yes and no, it doesn't need to be. Um, I'm thinking of one or more lines in the multiple signal hubs with different services from different clients. Yes, absolutely. So um, this is the, uh, let, me, let me stop this. Uh, so this was the server side, right? So this is the dashboard and, and this is like the chat hub. Uh, if you choose to like on this project, like if your client is also .NET, or if it's like Xamarin, then absolutely you can just go ahead and put it in the same solution. Or if you'd rather keep it clean, then just cut away and, and do a different one. Uh, now on the uh, client side, if you uh, this was the Xamarin app that I showed you, right? And and this this was the dashboard. And again, uh, what I'm doing here is we are creating that hub connection. And when I sent over that object, uh, keep in mind that data grid is bound to that object. So all I had to do was item source, and it's two way binding. So I can update the data behind the grid, and it updates itself uh, real nicely. Uh, but the one thing that you need to keep in mind is here I am specifying the connection, so I can reach that hub uh, that is sitting somewhere. This one's local host because I'm testing, but once you do want to go in production, you will need to reach that server hub. So no, you don't need to be in the same project, but you do need to be able to reach it, right? Uh, so uh, let's see, 1144. Uh, I'm waiting for Mel or um, Bill to kick me out, but I think I got 11 minutes maybe. So let me try uh, doing something that maybe is a little high risk and uh, we'll see if that works out. All right, so hold on for a second. Let me close this and we'll stick to the web side of things. And I'm going to pull up my favorite thing. Well, not quite my favorite thing. Uh, no, I don't want to install an update right now. This is Parallels. This is uh, running a VM. Uh, I have a Windows 10 box that I use for streaming, uh, but it's just easier to pull up a VM. Uh, no, activate a trial. I don't know what happened to my Parallels license. It's saying I'm on a trial, but that's fine. Um, so bear with me. Um, I'm going to let you get access to one of the local hubs or local host, and you'll see how quickly it gets a little overloaded. Come on, Windows. Come back, come back, come back quick. It's loading up um, and it's actually done pretty quickly. And I'm going to pull up Visual Studio on Windows VS 2019. And I'm going to show you this one here. So uh, this one here is a WPF application. And you can do this from a console app. You can do this from a UWP WinForms. Doesn't matter because it's all one client. In fact, the code here you're going to see is exactly identical to what we had um, in, in the Xamarin app because it's using the same .NET client. Now, before I can connect up to it, here's what we need to do. Uh, let me close this. And uh, we're going to go back to Visual Studio one more time. And we're going to fire this up. Uh, now, this is a classic case where 
you, you have a local host, right? But you want to test. I am on the same machine, but uh, to my Mac, my Windows is a VM. It's like crossing uh, machine boundaries, right? So you can't do that. So the solution to doing this, uh, and something that I actually find pretty slick, is this thing called NGROC. Uh, so it does a bunch of things, but uh, at the very basic, uh, level it does open up a tunnel so you can uh, expose your local host uh, to outside of your machine. Uh, so that's what I'm using and I have ngrok sitting here in my application somewhere I think. Uh, yeah, right there. So what I have to do is um, oh, come on, where is my terminal? There is my terminal. Okay. Um, let's make it a little bigger so you can see. So I can go applications I can type slash uh, ngrok, yeah? Yeah, there you go. So I can now do uh, that and I can say open up HTTP tunnel at 5001, because remember that's the IP by default is what it was using. So now it gave me a, a thing here, right? It says, uh, by the way, if you do this URL, then I will point you to localhost 5001, right? And um, I will open it up to you folks. Your sessions are very interesting. Thank you, thank you. Okay, now, please be gentle, keep it uh, uh, work friendly, but that's my URL, that's my local host. So if some of you wanna start hitting that, you'll see it will start getting overloaded. Uh, but uh, let me go back to Visual Studio here, and uh, I'm gonna paste this thing uh, there. So I'm going to NGROC and I'm going to that chat hub, uh, and hopefully you have not crashed my server yet. Let me just see. Oh, there you go. Some of you are uh, uh, tuning in. There you go. Yeah, keep it friendly. Keep it friendly. There's there's no monitoring or checking going on. Uh, so I can hopefully uh, start debugging. And okay, here we go. This is a WPF. I don't have the labels yet, uh, but let's see if it'll connect. Uh, because sometimes it doesn't. WPF says hello. Will this work? No, my server is probably overloaded. <laughs> uh, are any of you getting errors? No. Superman says hi. Hello, Superman. Okay. Okay, we're not going to spend too much time on this, but you get the point. Like, this is a WPF, this is WinForms. It'll all work the same way. Uh, and it's, uh, I just find NGROC nice to be able to uh, connect up to it. Um, did I paste something wrong here? No, that was the thing. Um, okay, I, I want to show you other things rather than um, belaboring on getting this demo to work. But again, you can see like this code is exactly what we had with Xamarin. We are connecting uh, to that signal hub with the start async, and then we can invoke that send message thing um, back uh, on the server, and we're sending that user and the message, and that's how it works. Okay, um, so trust me, it works. It works on my machine, so <laughs> it's got to work everywhere, right? Uh, but let me try showing you one more thing here before we have to end. Uh, let me close this down because my fan is going bonkers. Update and shut down. Okay, Rakesh, Eric, hey, no errors here. Okay, so I'll see him. You're not having host. trouble with your Mac, are you? No, no, Bill. How can I have trouble with my Mac? Macs are solid. <laughs> Oh, uh, I was emailing Bill at like uh, five in the morning to say, I can't see the team's tenant anywhere. <laughs> so I don't know. Uh, I had to uh, go. This is actually my work uh, email that you had that you added, Bill. So thank you. And then I'm finally able to see the tenant. So Teams is also playing pranks on me. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, so thank you, folks, for chiming into that. Let me show you one last thing and then we'll uh, we'll, we'll try to wrap this up. Uh, and this is kind of fun to kind of see. Um, let me see, where was it? Um, yeah, this one here. I say it's like beyond chat, but this is also uh, also a chat. Uh, so here, uh, you can see a couple of different things. Now notice so far, we have been always saying clients all send it all. You don't, you don't need to do that. You can group clients. Uh, now here, when I say clients.caller, then you're only referring to the person who pinged you from the, uh, from a client, right? You can send it to a specific person and every 
client has a context object, so you can you can know what the client is. Uh, it, you can stick like a JWT or a web token if you wanted to read their authorization. So you can do uh, authorization and um, uh, what's the word like um, authentication uh, on, on SignalR because it's it's sitting right on top of Facebook.net. Uh, and then you can add things to a group. Uh, and this one here, I think the other thing that I did here was, uh, yeah, doing this one. So notice how I did add signal art before. Now I'm saying add message pack protocol, which will make it uh, binary serialization. So it's a little more flatter and you can't read that uh, anymore. Uh, and I think uh, it needs uh, one more piece of JavaScript somewhere. Um, yeah, right here. So on the layout page, I have this like JavaScript, which again, you can pull it down from a CDN, um, but like two pieces of JavaScript is what you need. So if I go ahead and run this now, and let's see. What? Oh, this is the dev HTTPS. Okay, fine, run it. All right. This is, Oh, come on, I'm saying all, all is well. Yes, install and trust. Uh, I probably haven't run this project in a while. Okay, are you done? This is um, ASP.NET Core wanting to do HTTPS uh, locally. Okay, so uh, one more time, we're gonna pull up um, our edge, which seems like it's up. Right, and localhost 5001. No, this one is going to be uh, not using the same certificate. All right, uh, we'll we'll do one more of instance of this new window. We can move it over. There we go. Okay, so now um, if I say hi and if I say DM, notice how we have grouped it, right? So we invoked that on the caller. This guy did not get it. But when I say uh, say hello to all, now we got we get both getting it. And the other thing that uh, is interesting is um, what's happening under the covers. If I go to I don't know why I can't bring up my Dev Tools easily. Um, if I go look at uh, my network stack here, if I go on um, yep that, and then if I go look at the traffic. Now you see that this is message pack, right? So it tells you that there's a protocol switch. And if I do stuff here uh, like that, you see the messages going back and forth, but you can't read them because it's it's binary, right? So again, you, you can build chat rooms, you can group things together, you can control the message protocol, you can do a bunch of different things and it, everything is available to you uh, to do all of these things uh, with the APIs exposed. So. I am completely running out of time. So let me go back to my um, slides and I want to show you just one last, a couple of things just so uh, we end it right. Uh, so again, keep all of these things in mind. Again, if you're building this uh, in real life, you will have to think about all of these things and they're all very well documented. So if you think about security, logging, it's all out there. Uh, and some of you have asked about scaling before. Uh, keep in mind what we're doing here. So when you have a single server and all of this hub is in, in memory, you can keep track of all of your clients. But like server one here does not know anything about the clients that are connected to server two, right? So if you have things behind the server farm, then you have to think about doing something else and not keeping it in memory. You can put it in a SQL object, which is not very fast. This one here is an example of a Redis backplane, which is an in-memory database. So you can put like um, uh, key value strings and then that backplane controls exactly how you can reach out to every client. This is when if you have to do it by hand or you can let Azure do it for you. They have a real nice service called uh, Azure Signal R service, which is infinite sc uh, scalability as you expect. And it's just managed hosting. So you can connect it to any number of clients and it's all behind um, your, your firewalls and your, um, your, your server farms. And it knows how to reach every client because it keeps track of it in, in memory on Azure. So you're you're letting Azure do the heavy lift, lifting, and it gives you like a nice RESTful API, so you don't have to refer things by local host, and you can always reach out to your service and see who's connecting up to your hub and and whatnot. So it's it's very nice uh, way to kind of look at uh, how to host uh, Signal R apps. Okay. Um, I'm at time, so I'm going to stop here unless uh, more of you have questions. Uh, I do have Twitch streams if you want to come and hang out with me. It's coded live. 
And it's not just me, a couple of other folks on my team. We do all things .NET and JavaScript. Uh, and one more time, this is me. So if you need to reach out uh, after this, uh, you know where to get hold of me. So thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, I'm going to see if you have any more questions. Could you go over the overview? I could go over all of that until uh, I'm kicked out. Uh, where the hub is unable to handle too many connections. Okay. Uh, real quick, uh, just to answer that one, your hub will start refusing uh, new connections if it's getting overloaded, and then the users will start seeing errors until you can have more bandwidth and more memory and more stuff on your server so you can serve up more clients. So it goes back to how you're hosting it and how big of a machine it is, or you put it behind a server farm and then you have more added bandwidth, but then just keep in mind you have to uh, write things out somewhere because otherwise all the hubs are in memory and it has no clue what is what between different servers. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, folks. I've tried Azure Signal on our service. Azure Function works very well. Okay, good, good. I have not tried it with functions. That's very good. Okay, um, do we have any more time or Bill? I think I'm at time, right? Bill or Mel, if you're around. Uh, okay, so Raj, uh, Raj yeah. had another question. Yes, yeah. I do have a question for you. Yeah. Um, if I wanted to, uh, if I wanted to create, I, ha I have a web server and a, and a website. If I had a, uh, uh, if I wanted to build a, uh, an environment where I could coach someone uh, on a game, okay, and I want, I want to be able to show them. Um, I want to see them on uh, the screen, but at the same time, I want, uh, uh, let's say, go the game go. I want a game board on the screen while I can see them, um, and and both uh, the student and I can be uh, making moves. Now, I, I picture the go could be done using Signal R. Mm -hmm. like yeah. Yeah. Okay. But that, that is a very, very classic use case. Yeah. Think about okay. like real time games, anything where it's like a real time collaboration. It's, it's the perfect use case. Okay. So the question is do you have any way, uh, I mean, uh, any, uh, what can I go to be able to get part of the screen uh, to show the video? Because I, I, I haven't found anything in the .NET for doing video, but maybe there is. I don't know if you were aware of it since you're doing real time stuff. Um, uh, that's a loaded question. Like, uh, I mean, mo most of like HTML5 videos, if you're playing, so you, you're going to have to play that video on like uh, on all clients, right? So the video has to be either downloaded or be available locally. And then, like, uh, like ASP.NET will play uh, most supported videos. Like, I'm sure they're, they have documentation on how to load up a video from uh, maybe a remote server and played back. Um, I don't know if that's what you're asking. No, it's about real-time video. Oh. Like, like, I, uh, like right now, I'm, I'm in team and I'm looking at you. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this one portion of the screen, I'll see you. And uh, I was trying to figure out, well, how the hell can I do that to be able to have a I game see. part of the board and still be able to have uh, be able to look at the user via their own stuff. I mean, are you aware of anything in .NET that provide that? Um, no. And, okay. and, and, and um, what, what's your, what, you know, sorry, Bill, were you going to say something? There's, uh, there's WebRT that does real-time video streaming. Yeah. Web WebRT? Yes. Thank you yeah, so much. You know, what, what you're talking about is kind of building something like what Team or Zoom or any of these uh, clients do. And I, I have not done anything like that, but I mean, you're essentially uh, talking about carrying, instead of an object, you're carrying a stream of data from one client and then broadcasting out to everybody. So yeah, look at look at WebRT or any, any other streaming mechanisms. And, and okay. SignalR actually will support streaming. Uh, like if you uh, if you have a hub and that's connected to any number of clients, then you can send chunks of uh, data down to each client. So maybe that's that's the way to solve it. But I I have not gotten into like streaming video over okay. uh, SignalR. Yeah.